tēnā koutou katoa, ko te ahu mairangi, te monga, ko te awa kairangi te awa, ko Nari Pākiha, tōku iwi, nō te whanganui a tāra a hau, ko Susan, tōku ingoa. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. So welcome to uh, Te Ao Rangahou, which is uh, Engineering New Zealand. Uh, in the engineering world, I used to wonder about doing a mihi to open in many contexts, um, partly because for many of our engineering um, worlds, it's such a foreign concept. Uh, and I was conscious that it made the audience feel awkward and or, you know, I was worried that it would feel like cultural appropriation. In a diversity in agenda context, the concept is, of course, really well understood and accepted, but there are other barriers, such as knowing that um, my tereo, Māori, um, doesn't do this amazing language justice. But over the last few years, I've come to a really strong view that in both contexts, trying is really important, and te reo Māori, even as a beginner, is an important part of who we are as New Zealanders. So here at Te Ao Rangahau, Engineering New Zealand, with a, a really clear-eyed view that we need to be an inclusive and diverse profession, a mihi talks to our values. Uh, it's about respect and acknowledgement, of what has forged us and will continue to forge us as a nation. And today, just over two weeks from the horrific terrorist attack in Christchurch, which targeted another section of our New Zealand community, I feel even more resolved. It's uh, small steps like this that visibly take me out of my middle class Pākehā perspective that matter most steps that make me and sometimes other people feel uh, a little bit uncomfortable and challenge notions of we and us. And that's exactly what the diversity agenda is all about, inclusion. And it's why we're here tonight, because together we must continue to do things that make us uncomfortable and that challenge the narrative that feeds it feeds exclusionary thinking. I'm determined that where I can, I will make even a small difference in the small ways that I can. And the work that we're all doing with the diversity agenda makes it clear too that you want to all be part of that change. So thank you for that. So since we started the diversity agenda with NZIA and ASEN's just under a year ago, we've had 90 organizations join us in committing to make engineering and architecture um, more diverse, more inclusive, more accepting of, of the differences uh, that make up our communities. Uh, with nothing else, and there is more that we've achieved and quite a lot more to go, as we'll find out tonight, that is 90 organizations having conscious and intentional conversations and discussions about diversity and inclusion and taking concrete steps to change the dial. So we're super excited with what we are beginning to see and achieve and even more excited about where we might take this with your help. So thank you for being here tonight in the midst of your busyness to help make engineering and architecture the kinds of professions that welcome new people and that and that young people want to join and um, and be part of. Um, we want them to be seen as the exciting, creative, diverse, and inclusive uh, organisations and professions that they really need to be. So. Big thank you from me, everyone here at Engineering New Zealand. Um, we're delighted to have you in our space. Everyone at NZIA and ASENS, this is just the beginning. So before I hand to Rachel Hopkins, who's the Chief Executive 
of Diversity Works and our partner um, this evening. I just have a few housekeeping things. Engineering, after all. So the men's bathrooms are in the stairwell to the left of the lifts. Women's bathrooms can be found just outside uh, the stairwell opposite the door of this room. And there are unisex, ba unisex bathrooms in the main in the main office behind the printing photocopying machines if you need to find those. If the fire alarm sounds, please leave the building by the nearest stairwell and assemble in the Taranaki Street, in Taranaki Street on the harbour side. And in the event of an earthquake, drop, cover and hold until we say we can leave it's safe to exit. So now I'm going to hand you over to Rachel who's going to talk a little bit about Diversity Works and um, our partnership before she introduces us to tonight's guest of honour, distinguished Professor Paul Spoonley uh, and um, Guillermo, thank you. We're thrilled to have you all here tonight and to have you as our partner in some of our work. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, ko rangi toto te maunga, ko waitamata te moana, ko tamaki makoro te kainga, ko Rachel Hopkins takuingwa. And I'm privileged to be the Chief Executive of New Zealand's National Body for Workplace Diversity and Inclusion. And it's a privilege to be here tonight in this beautiful space with uh, Engineering New Zealand and the Diversity Agenda. It's a fantastic partnership for us. Diversity Works New Zealand is all about helping New Zealand organisations do diversity and inclusion well, and to do well because of it. To think about diversity and inclusion as the right thing to do, but also the thing that can unlock innovation and better performance in our organisations in a rapidly changing New Zealand. Um, and I'm joined tonight by Dr Guillermo Morello from my team. Um, and I'll introduce you soon to um, Professor Paul Spoonley, who is going to talk to us not only about this changing New Zealand that we are all a part of, but also about the New Zealand Diversity Survey. So this is one of the things that Diversity Works New Zealand does every year in partnership with Massey University to assess where New Zealand organisations are in terms of the investment and the priority and the initiatives that they are doing and working with and delivering around building more inclusive organisations. It covers everything, not just gender, but every diversity dimension. And at Diversity Works New Zealand, we know that the conversation inside organisations, these deliberate, um, courageous conversations that signatories to the diversity agenda are having, need to not just be about different target groups. They need to not just be about the counting they need to not just be about the difference that we can see. And they need to not just be about the differences that people acquire and their different experiences and their different mind frameworks. Really, to get the most out of diversity in our communities and in our workplaces, we need to build really confident, inclusive people leaders inside our organisations who can make sure that we are capturing all that thinking, all that different innovation, all those different frameworks, experiences, so that we manage risk better, so that we make decisions better, and so that we have a much larger suite of solutions that we can offer our clients um, and that we can deliver inside our organizations. And it's small steps, as Susan said, that helps us get there. And trying to understand what other organizations are doing, where we're doing well, 
and where we might need to focus our efforts is a great place to start. And that's why a survey um, and getting that data together always helps us um, think about what might be the next step for us. So what the way that we're going to do this evening is um, that Paul is going to talk to us about what does New Zealand look like at the moment and the results of the overall New Zealand diversity survey. You're the very first people to hear this. We have not, um, we haven't released these results. Uh, so you're the very first people to hear it. Um, and Guillermo has been looking at the subset of diversity agenda signatories who completed the survey and looking at what are the differences, what are the surprises, and what are the things that are different in your organisations that create opportunities. Um, and then we'll take any questions uh, about any about the survey, about demographics, about and about um, diversity and inclusion in your organisation. Uh, so please make the most of it. Professor Paul Spoonley is um, the I want to get this right, the Pro Vice Chancellor of the College of Humanities and Social Science at Massey University. Paul is a distinguished professor and he's also a fellow, has been a fellow for many years of the Royal Society. He's one of New Zealand's foremost, or is for New Zealand's foremost demographer and is a specialist in super diversity and immigration. So we're really lucky to have him here tonight. He's been incredibly busy. And this afternoon, just half an hour ago, gave his 57th um, media interview uh, because he is able to bring complex topics um, and make them easily understandable. And at Diversity Works New Zealand, we're really lucky to have this amazing relationship with Paul and his team in terms of the, the survey. But also Paul has been a judge of the Diversity Awards New Zealand for nearly 10 years. And um, we're really lucky to um, be able to hear from you tonight. Thank you, Paul. Um, kia ora tata katoa, nā mihi, nā mihi nui, e nā mana nā waka nā reo, o nā tangata whenua, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. Kia ora tata katoa. Um, I've just been at a function today in which um, I'm part of the football community in New Zealand, and we've been um, commemorating three of the um, players who died in the, in the mosque. So I'd just like to acknowledge the, um, the deaths, uh, um, Haere and the Mati Ote, um, I Hirama, um, Hari Kitiato, Hari Kitikainga, Emoe, Emoe, Emoe. So we just want to acknowledge what has been a, a dreadful event in, in our history. Um, I hit up a, I got five and a half, we got half, five and a half million dollars um, to look at what New Zealand will look like in 2038. So I want to build on some of the points that Rachel has made about the importance of diversity, but I want to say why in the next uh, few decades. Uh, it is going to become more important. And so I'm, I am going to give you a sort of 101 demography, uh, and then we'll come to the survey that we do with Diversity Works. Um, this decade, 2010, 2020, let's go to the first one. Uh, 2010, 2020 is the decade of major demographic change in this country. You'd have to go back to the decades after the Second World War and the baby boomers, the arrival of the baby boomers, to get anything so significant. So what I want to do is just briefly tell you a little bit about the components of that and why, in this context, diversity is going to become more important. I'm going to um, talk about gender, diversity, um, uh, talent pools, and immigration. So it's only part of the diversity story. Um, but the... the in 10 years, so in, in, in 2028, 2029, this will be what the country looks like. Um, we are concentrating our population very fast in Auckland. And so certainly within that uh, decade, 
40% of all New Zealanders will be resident in Auckland. So if we take that golden triangle, which is Auckland, Hamilton and Tauranga, that is going to comprise over 50% of all New Zealanders. So it's, it's, it's a very, it's a, very um, um, a, a trend towards urban concentration. But what will also happen is that both Māori and Asian communities uh, will be over 800,000 each. So one of the things that's happening is that we've moved. I'm, I'm the old type of migration. My parents were British. Um, but in fact, in the 21st century, our largest migrant communities come from, in, in order, China, India, and the Philippines, and then the UK. And so that is transforming what we do. But there's also ageing, which is going to change the dynamic. And Taranaki, do we have anybody from Taranaki here? No? All right. From Taranaki um, is the first region to see more people aged over 65 than 0 to 14. And I would, in other circumstances, show you a map which shows you the parts of the country where 30% or more of the population will be aged over 65. And increasingly, parts of New Zealand will see that balance shifting towards the elders. So what, what, what's happening? Well, first of all, there's the ageing. The baby boomers are re reaching, and it's, 65 is not retirement age. So it's, it's an arbitrary, 65 is quite arbitrary in terms of what we're talking about. But in 2013, we had 600,000 people aged over 65. And certainly within the next three to four years, we'll have 1.2 million. So we, we need to understand that, that ageing dynamic. Sub-replacement fertility is really, really interesting. And we're the last, one of the last OECD countries to experience this. But replacement fertility is 2.1 births. I've realized I haven't put this down here, but let me explain. 2.1 births per woman is replacement fertility. And the 0.1 is to allow for infant mortality. So at 1.7, which began first in 2017, we're not seeing enough births in New Zealand to replace our existing population. So we're not going to get population growth from births, from fertility. And then that will impact. And so you'll see there, 56 out of our 67 territorial authorities will experience either population decline or stagnation. If you go from Wairo around to Oporiki, that whole area is now in population decline. If you go to the west coast of the South Island, it is in population decline. Most regions will just see us stagnating. It won't, they won't grow. So we're concentrating our growth and not seeing it elsewhere. Can I go back to the sub-replacement fertility? We're just doing some really interesting work around why women in New Zealand, particularly who are tertiary qualified and are in professional qualifications like architecture and engineering, are choosing not to have children. 40% of women who are professionally qualified and in professional occupations are now choosing not to have children, even in a partnership. And that's a, it's a, it's a trade-off between having a child and having a career. And in this country, we make that a very difficult choice indeed. If you want to, uh, you probably have never heard of it, but the, the BNZ has a baby calculator. Has anybody heard of that? BNZ have a baby calculator. To bring a child up to age 21 in New Zealand, it, it costs more than $700,000. And so, you know, having children, uh, withdrawing out of the workforce has real financial implications. Um, the next thing is that what you're going to experience in professional communities like yours are skill shortages. So that when we begin to understand what the implications are, the 0 to 14 tells us what's in, coming along the pipeline. We're getting more people aged over 65. And by the way, a quarter of all people aged over 65 are paid in the paid workforce. So 65 is not the age of retirement, as I said before. And you're going to see significant industry shortages. And we can see them. If we take something like IT in this country, we need about 14,000 IT people entering the industry each year. In the university sector and the polytech sector, we produce about 4,000. About 4,000 change jobs each year. The rest of it is our shortfall. And if we don't have immigrants, we are seriously short of workers. So one of the things we need to think about is 
how do we retain people? How do we encourage people? How do we recruit people? How do we train people? And of course, and part of that is uh, immigration. And um, immigration is really about skills recruitment. 60% of the people who come to New Zealand and we give permanent residence to come under the skilled migrant category. Australia, Canada, ourselves are the only countries in the world that recruit people on the basis of skills. So we're doing two things. We are recruiting people in areas where we need skills in, the, in our economy, in our industries, and we're actually replacing the aging of the population, supplementing the aging of the population, because the people that come in, come in in prime working age, and quite often with families, and so they help um, contribute to population growth, but also easing our population decline. By the way, if you want to, if you want to look at what we'll be like in, say, 20 years, look at what Japan and Germany are like, and that's where we're heading, really, unless we, unless we, um, uh, unless we uh, continue to recruit skilled migrants. Um, the big change, of course, in the 1990s and then particularly since 2012 is that most of our migrants come from Asia. That's the big change. And so what does that mean? Well, uh, this is what we look like in 2038. If you look at the all categories, there's, a, there's, a, there's an anomaly here. We allow people to multiple identify with, in terms of the, their ethnicity. So if you add up those columns, they all add up to more than 100%. It drives people nuts, and people overseas don't understand it. So you either have got to be one or the other, and it'll bring us to 100%. We say, no, no, you can be, you can be two or more people. So that's why it adds up to more than 100%. Um, but what you'll see there is Māori will grow a little bit as total population, and Pacifica will grow a bit. But look at the Asian population. That's the big change in terms of our um, the composition of our population. And then over on the right, I've got the zero to 14 year olds. So those are the sorts of people that are coming through. In Auckland schools, in high decile Auckland schools, uh, particularly in the public sector, and uh, state sector, um, it is now typical to have between 35 and 45% of your students Asian. So if you want to look at New Zealand's future, look at some of our schools. And I'm sure that applies to here in Wellington. In Auckland, um, a, quarter, a, a third of all uh, the, uh, of the Auckland's population are from Asian communities. And by 2038, it will be almost 40%. So that's the change that's beginning to occur. As you can see, if you're not on top of diversity, you are going to struggle. Um, let me now come to the survey, and as Rachel said, this is your, this is the first anybody's um, seen of anything of this. So we're just giving you some sort of high level um, points really to take away. Um, the top um, issue. Ah, why have we? Why have, have I gone past one? Just bear with me for a second. No, I'm missing one. <laughs> the most important issues. I'm going to read. Have to read this. The most important issues are well-being, wellness. Number two is gender, and gender has really significantly increased in the last two to three years as an issue of concern in terms of diversity in the workplace. Bias and flexibility are the, are the, um, are the issues. So let's just go through these one by one. In terms of well-being and wellness, um, oh, why have I got that? Oh, there we are. <laughs> um, th so those are the those are the um, issues in terms of small and large organisations. What's really interesting is how large organisations are uh, up the game. So these are percentages of people from large organisations who are identifying what is an important issue. Um, there is quite an issue in New Zealand in terms of how small and medium enterprises are responding in this environment. Certainly our work um, here, confirmed here, but also as part of what we've been doing in terms of repeat surveys of employers, is that um, the small and medium enterprises are so focused on bottom line productivity and financial well-being that they really don't spend a lot of time looking at these, whereas large organisations have an opportunity to do that. 
Um, so in terms of well-being and wellness, these are the three issues in rank order uh, that organisations are, are concerned with. Um, and as you can see, I mean, the, I don't think there's any surprises there. Uh, the mental health of employees. Um, Rachel mentioned that I'm a, a judge for the Diversity Awards. I must say that some of the organisations are doing a fantastic job in trying to respond in the workplace to issues like mental well-being. Um, can I mention? Well, I mean, Lion, some, Lion as in the beer company, um, really has worked very hard to have days and give permission to people to talk about their mental well-being. Really, really powerful. Um, the next issue is one of bias. And as you can look down that list, uh, you will see there the both the impact of bias on your organization, um, but also what it does in terms of impacting upon decision making in organizations. So those are the four issues which were identified by New Zealand organizations in terms of responding to bias. Um, by the way, this um, PowerPoint is uh, is available to you. You can you can uh, you can um, uh, you can access this. Um, <clears throat> flexibility is one of the other major issues, and again, we're having some uh, some very interesting shifts on how organisations work, and flexible work time, working remotely, and then reduced hours. So just giving people the opportunity to work around other things. Some of it might be family, but other things might be things that you're also interested in doing alongside your work. And you will be aware that one large organization in Auckland has moved to a four-day week. Same pay, four-day week. They argue that their productivity has actually gone up. So it's a, it's a, it's a really interesting um, response. Um, in terms of addressing diversity, and I'm just now beginning to come to the end so that we can uh, allow others to speak. Um, in terms of addressing diversity, and I'm going to come to some rather unusual um, results from the survey, but those are the four top issues as far as organisations identified. Um, is diversity addressed in HR policies? Is there top management leadership and commitment and involvement in diversity issues? And certainly when I go out as a diversity judge into organisations, often the tone and the success is set by top management. And it comes down. Communications and promotion to internal stakeholders. And by the way, in terms of the diversity strategy and plan and the communications and promotion, one thing that really does frustrate me is that organisations will have a plan and then will not monitor it. They will not collect statistics. And you say, well, um, can you tell us how many take gender, ethnicity, age in particular? Well, no, no, because our staff don't like us collecting ethnicity data. Well, I'm sorry. Then you've just made an issue for yourself because you actually can't tell how successful you are being. Um, this is the, the the policies that firms have or don't have. Now, you remember back to what I said at the beginning about ageing? One of the things that firms could do is think about how they retain older workers or reutilise older workers in terms of... Um, but 60% of the firms that we surveyed have no policies in place. They're prepared to identify ageing, but then don't, uh, then don't follow it through. So can I just leave you with a, um, a question, really? We are experiencing very significant demographic change. It's going to put a lot of pressure on organizations and in the industries to think about how they react in this environment because the competition, particularly for skill, is going to become much more intense. And so diversity really gains in importance. And so the question is, how do you respond in that environment? Oops. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Would you like to bring the um, 
stools over here. I think that Sean needs us to put them in the front. That would be great. Thank you, Paul. And sometimes just seeing these things in front of us and realizing the reality and thinking about things in three to four year time frames instead of thinking about 2038, which feels like, well, in our world of, um, you know, KPIs that only last for six months and um, chief executives that only last for three years, that seems like, well, we, we don't need to think about it. But actually, these are things that are happening to us right now. Um, and I'm sure that there wouldn't be a person in this room who wouldn't be experiencing skill shortages uh, right now. So th th these are really important things. I just I just want to talk from quickly before um, Guillermo talks to you about some of the, the differences between that data and diversity agenda signatories. Just from Diversity Works New Zealand's perspective, a couple of things there. Um, Paul talked about the uh, ethnicities adding up to more than 100%. And one of the things that is really striking about our younger population as opposed to our older population is that incredible difference. So if I am over 55, I'm more like, much more likely to identify with only one ethnicity. But our younger populations and under 25s are much more likely to identify with multiple, multiple ethnicities. And therefore, the expectations are that um, they move through life in ways that you can move from between cultures seamlessly and um, and they're expecting that in the workplace as well. And it's a real challenge for our members um, at Diversity Works New Zealand about how do we help our people leaders who are often in that older category to understand and feel confident about how to move seamlessly through different um, through different cultures. And it's something that all of us need to take responsibility for in our organizations is how can we help ourselves feel more confident? What learning can we do? And how can we help our people leaders um, to, to do that well? And look, this difference between large and small organizations, this is something that we do really well at Diversity Works New Zealand in terms of sharing and connecting. So if you do come from a small organization and you are needing more support, make sure you connect in with through the diversity agenda and the access that you have through the partnership with Diversity Works New Zealand because we can connect you with other organizations. 40% of our members have less than 50 employees and are doing um, some of them are doing some really amazing work in, in this field. And the last thing I wanted to talk about was just this idea of top management commitment. And I know Guillermo is going to talk about this. But we know, so the way that we uh, classify our 460 organisations that are members at Diversity Works New Zealand is not by their size, not by their sector, uh, not by their region. It's by where they are on their diversity and inclusion journey. And what we know is at the end of that journey is a category that we call champion. And in that champion, there is always, 100% of the time, both top level commitment, usually mostly from the chief executive, combined with a really active grassroots diversity committee, employee network, whatever you want to call it, with a very strong connection, bringing that in grassroots input and ideas connected with that top level commitment. And that is a real key to success. The commitment alone um, is, is not enough. Anyway, Guillermo, would you like to share the, mm. some of the sort of three or four of the top insights um, in looking <laughs> at the differences between being a signatory to the diversity agenda and um, our general survey. Yeah, it was very interesting to explore the data when it comes to the diversity agenda. And I have to say that in the beginning, I did it without first knowing the results of the survey. 
So when I saw the results and then I started comparing, comparing, it's like, okay, this is very, very interesting. The first thing that we noticed, and I think I'm going to start with the good part of the, the good set of findings is that uh, just like Paul mentioned in the general uh, part of the survey, uh, the number one each issue was well-being and the second one was gender. For members of the diversity agenda, it was a tie in the first place for both uh, well-being and gender. So basically gender is the first, uh, the number one issue uh, for all of you for all of your organizations and and we think that's uh, an, an amazing uh, difference uh, the other thing that was very uh, interesting was in terms of women's representation in governance uh, your results members of the diversity agenda score higher than uh, the rest of the survey and you score higher in all of the groups we're talking about uh, we divide in the survey representation of more than 25 and up to 50, 50 to 75, and more than 75 in all of these categories, uh, you score higher. Uh, I think another interesting finding was uh, that in the three most common issues uh, for the general survey, it was well-being, it was gender, and it was bias. But for the diversity agenda, the third one was not bias, but flexibility, which is very related to gender. And in that regard, also talks a little bit about how you are visualizing gender into uh, your whole equation. Uh, the challenges that remained there uh, many challenges. Oh, no, sorry. I need to, to talk about one other positive that was very positive, and it was about commitment. Uh, Paul mentioned about top commitment, uh, commitment from the very top of the organization. And this was a very impressive finding with uh, people from the diversity agenda, from organizations. The difference between the general survey, I think the general survey was 66% of them have top commitment from uh, the organization to diversity. For members of the diversity agenda, this was 87%. So that's more than 20% difference. That's talk, that talks a lot about the level of commitment that this initiative is getting from the top levels. Uh, the challenges, uh, very quickly, I would say, we see a lot of commitment. We see that gender is a priority, but uh, there are still many formal actions and many things that need to be done to create a strong foundations for diversity and a, a, at least sometimes a very basic diversity infrastructure. For instance, 80% of members say, well, gender is a priority, but only 60% have a specific policies or interventions to address gender. And that is something that probably needs to be talked about more. Uh, the other thing that I would say is about, uh, I mentioned about women in the governance uh, level, uh, it was good, but in leadership position, in all categories, uh, members of the diversity agenda score lower than uh, uh, the general survey. That means that we are seeing more women in governance, but less women at the executive level. And that is in itself a very big challenge. Uh, something that also I would like to highlight is that while for most of our members, uh, diversity training is something that is happening all the time and they identify that as one of the most popular diversity interventions, for members of the diversity agenda, uh, there were low scores, basically in the three categories that we have in there, which is diversity training for managers, diversity training for employees, and diversity training for uh, new employees in onboarding process. So that's uh, probably something to reflect on 
as well. Uh, finally, I think there is um, an issue with bullying and harassment, and particularly with uh, the difference between large and small organizations. In this sample, we noticed that large organizations of the diversity agenda, they have policies, 100% of them have policies for bullying and harassment, but small organizations, less than 40% have these initiatives. And if we consider that also, uh, and just like it happened in the, in the big part of the survey, uh, issues such as religion and sexuality, and disability were not that important for members of the diversity agenda. Uh, bullying is an issue as well. And when you think about women and how being a woman intersects with other categories, uh, such as religion, and particularly now that we're seeing the things in Christchurch, it's not the same to be a Pakiha, Pakiha woman than to be a Muslim woman and how you access the workplace. So those little in those little things intersect in such a way that one needs to be very careful about how to address other issues such as bullying and harassment and how these reflect not just in Pakeha women but in other type of women inside our organizations. But well, overall, that's all I could share. So what what is going to happen is that um, the diversity agenda are going um, is going to um, share with you the full report of, and that includes all the results of everybody in the diversity agenda who participated in the survey, um, uh, which was a large number of you, and also those reflections of where there is a difference between all of the participants and, um, and the diversity agenda. Um, so look, there's been a lot of information there and a lot of, a lot of numbers and a, a lot of ideas. And um, it would be great just to hear from you. Any comments, any questions, any things that that raises for you? Gina. Um, I'm just wondering, when you're talking about gender, are you talking male, female primarily, or male, female, transgender, non-binary, and the other species? Uh, the latter. Um, one of the things that was very disappointing about the fact uh, that the last census didn't actually address that. So just having binary male-female is no longer appropriate, mm. is my view. Yeah, absolutely. And when, mm. um, so you talked about demographic surveys mm. and um, inside organisations. And one of the things is that um, we used to always use the census as the uh, benchmark standard of how you, how you ask questions. And what we're finding um, really is that that's, very behind what employee feedback is around both in gender but also in ethnicity um, and so the, yeah the, the when you're looking at those issues really important to, to look through that Can and I, to really take a note sorry take note of your um, people who prefer not to say and what that says about your organization so, so um, the organization that got the award last year was Mid Central Health, and the way in which it dealt with um, gender positions in the workforce, and they have a really powerful program that is very gender fluid, but also very gender respectful. So it didn't it didn't matter what, and some of the most powerful interviews that we heard were from people who are transgender. Um, in the workforce, it was it, it really is inspiring. So they were positive. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. They, they 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 do th little things. Oh, sorry. They do little things like they have a little badge, which says that um, you know a little multicolored badge which says that I am respectful of whatever your gender is, and what they did was they wanted to make sure that all employees would signal that they hold. That, that view, that approach in the organisation. And uh, it, 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 so people who were transgender would notice that, you know, all the people around them were prepared to recognise that they were transgender and there were issues, um, all sorts of issues in the workplace that they could then talk about and resolve mm -hmm. rather than just keep them quiet. Mm. 
I was just going to say that there's a um, that there is a fantastic video telling you that story, and it's a beautiful example of a grassroots idea that um, only cost one hundred and sixty seven dollars uh, for them <laughs> to um, bring into Very into specific. being, and because it was so successful, they then got top level commitment. Um, so it can can work both ways. Any other questions? Yes, in the back row there. Hello, my name is Girish, and um, my question is, I'm reading a lot after this Christchurch incident, and my question is, if there's a small organization, and I'm quite frank to ask this question, that if they, if they employ, I mean, if they want to employ, somebody and the person is a Muslim who says that I have to pray on Friday, let's say is a ground duty officer or the um, at the airport, you know, who guides the pilot to land mm. and to take off. Now, if airport like Napier who can't employ two ground duty officer for eight hour shift because of the cost, and if the person is a Muslim and he says, well, I have to pray mm. on Friday and I, I need that, would that organization or small organization where they can employ only three or four people or maybe two, like in a restaurant, how comfortable they would be employ a Muslim mm. in that kind of situation? Would you call it discrimination or would you call it, well, they can say, oh, and the, the Muslim can take you to the court also. Mm. You are being discriminatory. How do you justify that kind of situation? Mm. Thank you. Do you want me to have a go? Yes. Okay. Um, um, firstly, I think that um, workplaces now need to recognize all sorts of cultural practices. So it doesn't matter whether it's a tangi, a tangi leave for Māori, um, whether it's something to do with a school, or as you say, a requirement in this case for Muslims to pray. I don't, for me, the question is equity. It, 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 it's the same as, for example, um, you probably don't remember, but we had some very religious rugby players who refused to play on Sundays, and yet a lot of our rugby is now played on Sundays. So how do we resolve those situations in a way that is safe and it's safe for the employee, but it's also safe for the organisation. And I'm very much in the school that we need pragmatic but respectful policies. Uh, you mentioned uh, discrimination. I think if you're looking at legislation and discrimination via legislation, then you're probably going about it the wrong way. I think legislation is the end of the approach, not the beginning. And so I'm, um, Rachel mentioned my 57th, uh, 57th interview today with um, German television here. Um, one of the things I'm talking about is hate speech. I think we've got to have policies around hate speech, but the answer is not legislation. Um, part of the answer is legislation. So I think there are really good examples of workplace policies and leadership and management and we need to share that best practice. And the sort of instance that you've talked about, which is very real and has very practical impacts for people and for a work situation, I think there are actually um, workarounds that you can do. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just want to compliment what Paul just said. In, uh, one of the uh, people who were shot at the mosque uh, that day was a, a friend of mine and a, and, a, and a former colleague, and I was his supervisor. And actually, I was the one who arranged everything so he could go to pray on Fridays. I mean, it was a little bit of, it's still a little bit difficult <laughs> to yeah, talk yeah. about that. Uh, but I remember at that time when I was, uh, when I was having this conversation with him, uh, something that uh, he mentioned is flexible working is something that is normally associated with female workers, but it should be seen 
uh, in a different way. And I and we see that these days. It's been it's it's expanding uh, to fit the needs of different populations. It's not just about being flexible for women, but being flexible for everyone who may have different shadows for things in life. So the practical way in which we are addressing this, uh, most of the times is flexible working. Thank you. Next question. Any other questions? <laughs> Susan has the mic. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that that story about a, a very tough. Um, just coming back to the the difference in the diversity um, general, the survey generally, and the diversity agenda stats. Um, really high commitment, which is obviously a positive thing, and what we probably hope and expect just a year in, and a, a lag, I guess, in seeing results. How, in, in organisations that uh, have done this for a while, what's the sort of time frames you look at? And how do you, yeah, so, and in terms of the concrete steps, you talked about training and policies, and we've just talked about flexibility. But you know, how can you how can you galvanize the how can our organizations galvanize the grassroots as well as have the commitment if that's what's needed? Lots of questions, sorry. Lots of questions there. So in, in terms of time frames, um, there are people that we talk to who've been working in say financial services looking at um, improving the statistics and empowerment um, and retention of women in senior positions, probably really actively for about eight years. Um, but the ones who have really made inroads are the ones who don't just um, rely on the personality of a senior person and their active commitment. They're the people who have real interventions and that, as Paula said, are measured. And so the way that you um, galvanise um, grassroots is to go out there and to engage with your employees about what does this mean? And it also really means creating targets, key performance indicators, real measures um, you've created a real measure for the diversity agenda, which is 20% more. So really, inside every organisation that is a signatory to the diversity agenda, there should be some modelling. If we keep doing what we're doing now, will we reach 20% more? Uh, and if we will reach 20% more, when will that be? I'll tell you a story about one of our alliance partners, Vodafone, doing work in this area. They have a global target. Um, of 40% of women in their executive leadership. Um, and they thought they're doing really well. And so what they thought is they'll just quickly do a model for the board about when that the fact that we're going to be able to deliver this by 2021. No, we're going to be able to deliver this by 2045 if we keep doing this, if we keep going the way that we're doing. So we have to really look at what are the interventions um, and, you know, there are really great examples and there are fantastic private and public organisations who you have access through to the, through the partnership with Diversity Works New Zealand who can talk to you about what some of those um, interventions are. But unless they're real interventions, unless they're part of your process and your systems, and unless they're measured, um, the timeframes will be extremely slow and you won't meet the target for the diversity agenda. There is a question in the back, but I'll yeah, I've just this follow up. Sorry, and this in terms of targets, it's a com it's a it's a question that's asked a lot mm -hmm. by our um, diversity agenda founding partners and change makers. Um, comment on those. You've just made one, but why is it so important? Because we're also focusing on inclusion. Do you have anything to add on my comment on targets? Um, well. 
I mean, I, I think there are a number of answers to why. I mean, part of it is actually bottom line. I mean, one of the things that you notice about uh, New Zealand firms is that those that are focused on their shareholders don't do as well as those who are focused on their stakeholders. And those stakeholders include employees. So having a very narrow focus on a bottom line and therefore not being aware of your social responsibilities or your um, your responsibilities towards inclusion actually is not good business practice in terms of your bottom line. I, th I think there's a sort of moral, political and ethical issue. I think there's a pragmatic issue, which is the demographics. So all of you are going to experience um, increasing skill shortages and talent shortages in terms of the talent. So if you're not making good use of the people that you've got, and, and particularly around gender, ethnicity, migration, those sorts of issues, you're going to be worse off than your other people in the, in the, in the marketplace because those people are going to be taking a very positive, proactive approach because it helps with addressing skill shortages and, and talent shortages. Yeah. So I think, that, I think there are a whole series of answers to that. Um, and look, I, I tell you about David McLean, the chief executive of Westpac New Zealand, and he said, look, we, we didn't start making progress until I gave my GMs targets. Um, and uh, whatever that is, if that's the way that your business works around targets, um, it's something that people understand. Um, and what happens is that you're in the, he said to me the initial reaction was, but there aren't enough people for me to provide a gender balanced um, shortlist every time I recruit. That was one of the KPIs. Um, but what happens is he said that the target, he said, well, that's, that's the KPI. End of conversation. So what happens then is that you have to create your pipeline. You have to um, start doing initiatives that really look for um, diverse candidates. And, um, and you have to start fast tracking and pulling people, pulling people through. So having a target also, um, you know, really drives behaviour. Can, can, can I add something? I get very frustrated with some employer uh, strategies in here. Um, many of them tend to poach. They will pay a little extra to get somebody from another firm rather than grow their own. We, we talent, um, um, talent recruitment, but also helping talent inside your industry or inside your organisation is actually done very poorly in New Zealand. And I don't know whether you saw, but Treasury did something a few years ago which said that the major barrier to productivity and um, capturing the, 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 the skills of your workforce is actually the attitude of managers. If you were to change one thing, it is it would be the thing. And yes, question in the back there. Thank you. Um, I think that what you were talking about, I have I had a different question, but the, what you were talking about with targets, I think, and changing that attitude of managers, I feel like that's it feels it gets into a really uncomfortable part of the conversation because it feels like maybe people people feel like they've earned where they've gotten to, and how do they shift? How do they make that shift without some sort of um positive discrimination or something could you talk about that and I have two other questions um could you <laughs> I have more I'll, than two, I'll write but, it down. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um how can organizations measure their diversity easily what is what are some how much is enough and what's an easy way for people who are not experts like you um to get into this and the other question is could you talk a little more about equity I think you you started to talk Paul Spoonley about equity yeah. could you say a few more Do words talk about, about that Equity. Equity. We'll start with that one. Oh, equity. What was I saying about equity? Oh, equ equity, equity, <laughs> equity. That, that, was, that was one of the issues that, uh, that, that came up in terms of the uh, diversity survey. And it's one of the most difficult things to address because where you started with your questions, we get, uh, we, I think we, and I'm, I'm including Diversity Works here, mm. we get a lot of pushback from people saying that people are being treated unfairly. 
Um, and I've done quite a lot of work in the education sector. And what's really interesting is that some of the things that we use to identify success actually don't measure success at all. Um, I'm not sure quite what to use as an example here, but um, I did a lot of work around entry into medical schools. And grade point average is actually a very poor indicator of who's going to be a good doctor. And, and, and it's one of those things that we need actually to put people into positions and to help them uh, in terms of their professional development, but also in how they operate in those positions. And we get quite a lot of um, occasions, probably anecdotes, if I'm being honest, but occasions when we say, well, we, we don't want to put them in, in that position because of, and yet actually when they do put them in that position and give them the support, they actually get very good performance outcomes. So I'm, I'm, we, we tend to measure things in a very crude way, which is proportion of people in executive positions who are women. Actually, what you need to do is say, if we're being an effective and functioning organization, we should say, what are the benefits quantitative but qualitative around that mm. it's it's going back to that example of 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 giving uh, giving everybody the same pay but giving them three days off a week not two really an interesting one it's it's things like um accessing people in terms of after hours by texting or by emails and expecting people to reply so what's your what's your policy around that? And then what are the outcomes for people's well-being and their productivity? So I think we've got to have a more nuanced way of, it's like at a national level, GDP is actually a very poor indicator of what an economy is doing. There are a lot of things that aren't measured. A woman's work, a woman's unpaid work, for example, volunteering. So I think we need to be much more nuanced in how we measure those things. Um, but I'm taking over, I'm answering a question that was asked of you. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. yeah, in terms of metrics, uh, we see many of our members asking us all the time, how do, how do I develop good metrics? How do I develop good metrics? And uh, sometimes they did, yes, there are a series of very complex uh, metrics, but uh, sometimes I, I feel like organizations are just worried about how to achieve numbers in there. And there's so much more uh, to do diversity and inclusion. Uh, something I can say is that I, we are witnessing more and more kind of a sort of complementary metrics uh, to measure diversity and inclusion. And it's not just the perspective of crude numbers uh, anymore in terms of recruitment and things like that. Right now, I think we're moving uh, um, to more uh, what we call perceived diversity climates. PDCs, mm. how people feel inside the organization and uh, how do you feel that your organization values diversity, your colleagues values diversity, and actually you can create also targets in, uh, in, in, in that regard. But it's not just that one, it's kind of a combination of different metrics that can go from your pay gaps to how people feel. Can I? Sorry, you're gonna, can I say something else? I think underlying your question is, if you have a target like 20%, yes. um, you get quite a lot of pushback and resistance. And that might be um, actual, or it might be, you know, um, uh, in the background. And I think we've got to take those sorts of questions and concerns very seriously, and we've got to answer them. So we, we organizationally, have to be very clear. If we've got a target which concerns ethnicity or gender, there are going to be people in our organization who feel very uncomfortable with that. Mm. And we've got to talk to them about why. And we've got to make sure that we bring them along with that on their journey with us. Otherwise, they have the potential to undermine what we're trying to achieve. Because they are generally the dominant group and the people <laughs> that... Um, uh, see their privilege as something that they've earned. Um, so I, I just see your first and third questions as linked, and I'd just like to answer those really quickly. So, you know, talking about that uncomfortableness and fear and the react defensiveness and that people feel around targets, our whole role is, Hemo is heading to Auckland 
So, Thank you, Guillermo. Me, yes. <laughs> I'm coming down. In a minute. Um, so, <laughs> my taxi, sorry. <laughs> to the airport. I'm, I'm just getting going. <laughs> um, and look, I think that you can talk to people all you want about the facts and about why diversity and inclusion. There are thousands and thousands of academic studies that show that diversity and inclusion improves the performance in your business, improves the outcomes for your stakeholders. But what, um, it only works if you manage diversity well. And you can tell people facts until you're blue in the face, but if they have a fear, about they're going to lose something if someone else gains something. Um, that's your real issue that you're dealing with, and that's what Paul's talking about. And so it's linked to the difference between equality and equity. So inequality, we're focused on what's the opportunity that we give everybody and making sure that everybody has the same. So if you think about everybody standing on a box to look over a fence, you give everybody a box, but they're actually all different heights. So... Equality is just giving everybody the same thing. Equity is thinking about what, what are you looking at over the top of the fence? And that the fact that and what you want to do is give everybody the same opportunity to see the same thing. And so if everyone has to have different levels of boxes, that's okay. Because isn't it fantastic if the, what you're looking at over the fence is your goals, uh, the way you want your organization to be, you want people standing alongside you who can all see the same thing. Um, and so I think that diversity and inclusion done well is about an and. It's, an, it's a good for everybody. And having those conversations in our organizations about equity help people understand that, that they're not losing. They're getting, they're going through. Ciao. Ciao, Gilmore. Did you, you, you had your hand up before. Did you have a question? I, or? Well, I sort of did. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you spoke earlier about um, the percentage of women who are choosing uh, their career over having children. Yes. The importance or the, the fear that you have around that in terms of our repopulation and yes. our ability to stay productive and, and all of those things. What, what, my first question was, what was that number? Because I missed that. It, it, well, it, it's not entirely clear, but it looks, okay. uh, in terms of millennials who are tertiary qualified and are in a professional occupation, 40% of women in New Zealand are choosing not to have 40%. children. Yes. And then there's the one and done. So the, the next group are the people who are choosing only to have one child. So, and I guess my question about that is, because that seems kind of shocking to me, um, in terms of the health of our population and growth and productivity, yeah. what can we do about that? No, nothing. Um, <laughs> the, the, the Scandinavians, the Scandi I mean, in Scandinavia, half of, your, half of your personal income goes in tax, so they have a lot more discretion than we've had for a very long time. So they've had all sorts of schemes to increase um, fertility, and all of them have failed. So uh, just to – 1.7 is our um, – birth rate per woman in New Zealand. If you go to Catholic Europe, so Portugal, Spain, Greece, Italy, it's at one. If you go to China, it's at one. So they're already one and done. So one, one, yeah. one child per woman. They're, they're, the, they're already one and done. So they're a long way from reproducing their current population in terms of births. And um, we're actually... Uh, avoided that for a long time. We, 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 we're all, in terms of the OECD countries, we're about the last country to to go sub replacement fertility. Um, but in terms of people who've been successful, there ain't anybody reversing the fertility. Yeah, well, that's right. It's no, no. Well, I'm just reporting it. I'm not saying this thing is going to. Yes. Yes. No. Yeah. Yes. No, not necessarily Muslim, um, but in terms of the Pacifica, so Tongan's very high fertility rate, and that's why there's a delay for the Maori and Pacifica populations. They will 
they're, they're effectively about 20 years behind. And by the way, can I just say something? So our Prime Minister having her first baby at 37 is absolutely typical of middle-class Pākehā in New Zealand in 2019. And the other thing to just note, we're off topic here, sorry, Rachel, but the other thing is that um, Neve will have an average life expectancy as a, a, new, a female, a Pākehā female born in New Zealand in 2018 of 92. And the impact and the effect of that is that half of all women born in New Zealand last year, Pākehā woman born last year, will live to be more than 100 years of age. I'm slipping off my seat. So it, it's actually quite a complex story, but it's a really interesting story. So most children born last year were born in New Zealand to women aged over 30. Question here. Um, just following on from what you're saying about other countries going to a one and done mentality. Yes. Taking the view that we're talking about the diversity agenda in achieving equity within the workplace, do you imagine that that number would start to increase? Because I assume that in Germany, they also have these issues regarding women yes. and leadership and the opportunities for that. Yeah. No. Um, can I just, we've been talking about it at a national level. So nothing much makes a difference at the national level, but quite a bit can be done in terms of industries and organisations. So that's where the, that's the front line, really, in terms of in terms of, of of providing for the opportunity to consider children. And it's not it's not just simply a female thing, by the way. It's a male female thing. So it's I mean we're really bad at this country at um, at providing for male. Um, time off, male time off for males, um, with with children, um, but I think the the challenge really that I want to put back to you is either managers or potential managers is how do you how do you actually provide for people in your workforce to have children and to raise children? So it's not simply just at the point of birth, of course. It's the the sicknesses, the, I mean, it's going back to our, you know, the, the, the question asked about Muslims. It's being able to provide all those opportunities that you need to be somewhere else to doing, do something else. But of course, you can be working remotely. So how good are we at that? Actually, it's identified in the, in the, in the, in the survey, but actually we're not that good at it. So I think it's, I think it's quite a complex issue, but it's a very interesting one. And um, certainly, I don't know where we go, where we go with this in terms of national policies, but I think organisationally uh, we should do much better. We've got time for one final question from the back here. Sorry, it's a bit of a change of topic, but how do companies deal with their clients' prejudices when it comes to people managing projects and going to meetings and things like that? This is an amazing topic. Um, it seems to have um, I've been addressed it about five times in the last five days. Um, in legal profession and in um, and in engineering and thinking about um, this concept of of merit and promotion and um, you know that to become a partner or a senior leader in a professional services firm you have to have done really complex work to have done really and to have a good um, you know a, a good book um, of work that you have done and in order to do that clients and customers have to brief the work to you and want you on their projects teams and you have to have been selected into a tender or a proposal team um, inside your organisation and be introduced to those clients and for them to be able to step back around their unconscious bias when they look at a woman and think, am I going to get the best hardcore legal advice here? Um, these are questions that get answered, that get asked, and I don't know what the the similar ones would be in engineering, um, but these are ingrained bias. It's also around women with the title chief executive. It's also around any women in a directorship position. That there are different expectations that are part of people's brains um, that were created in their minds before they were five. Um, but it's a really important issue to think about inside organisations. What can we do to make sure that our 
pipeline of future female, future women are getting the same exposure to the fantastic work. Um, and that has to be a conversation that you have um, as part of the diversity agenda. So who are our, um, who are our customers? I know that most of you are professional services organisations in that in that category. And so who are the customers and what are the conversations that you're having with them about what are they doing in their organisations um, to improve female representation? Um, and uh, what do they think needs to happen in the procurement pathway um, uh, in order to make sure that there is good gender representation, uh, good diversity, um, because we know, all the studies show us, that diverse teams with really competent, confident, inclusive leaders are going to get the best results in problem solving. Uh, that's what your, what your customers need. Can I ask, answer the question in a slightly different way? Absolutely. So, some years ago, we did a, a project with employers, and what we wanted was them to be absolutely honest. So one of the things we wanted them to be absolutely honest about is who would you prefer not to employ? And one, two, and three were immigrants, school leavers, and women. And then what we did was we asked why. And the if you're if you're an immigrant, school leaver, woman, you're you're <laughs> you're triple challenge, aren't you? And then we asked why. And and the in terms of the immigrants, it was that they introduce costs to our workplace we can't be convinced that they will observe health and safety because there are language issues and one of the things we did was i was part of an eda an economic development agency in auckland and what we did was we put uh, immigrants into the workplace on a three-month pay basis and after three months employers would say actually i'm not sure why i felt that mm. um, in terms of the school leaver it was around experience and in terms of women it was about um, taking time out to have family and uh, it was pretty shocking i must say um, but i think part of what we need to be doing is having these honest conversations in terms of first of all why are you doing what you're doing and then what can be done because in terms of all of those three objections to those three groups there's perfectly good answers they're not, they're not necessarily workplace problems. They are workplace opportunities. I mean, that's management speak, but you know what I mean. It's, it, it, you can actually address all of those, um, and it's, it's a real shame. Try, try being a school leaver. Try being a school leaver in New Zealand and getting a job. Mm. It is a huge challenge. And what we've done is we've looked at young adults from 18 to 34, and they don't actually get a decent job for a long time. And typically the amount of time they spend in any given job at the moment is one year. They're, they're really moving around the workforce because they get, to be honest, shit jobs with shit pay. And it takes a long time before they get into the, into the workforce. Yeah. Two Sorry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Yes. And as you're saying, you can't generalize and generalize and generalize. Yeah. It is actually having to go by mm. what they say or what they do. Mm. So it's actually not just a single thing. Yeah. Uh, it's a package of things. Yeah. Yeah. And can I add one other thing? What was very disappointing was displacement. Managers would say, um, our workers don't like immigrants. So they, mm. they put the blame on the workers. If we, if we introduced immigrants into the workplace, uh, it wouldn't work. Mm. Uh, well, I'm sorry, that's a management failure. So I think getting that sort of um, collaboration uh, is, is, a, is a good strategy. Um, and look, I hope to see a, many people from the diversity agenda at the Wellington workshop called Men as Allies, which is in a couple of weeks. Um, at, um, the, the <laughs> yeah, it's a plan. But it is, it is, it is critical. Um, and the idea of the people with privilege 
um, and not the people that are underrepresented. It is the it is the responsibility of the people with privilege to drive doing diversity and inclusion well, not the responsibility of underrepresented people. Um, so look, there there are lots of facts. There are lots of things that feel shocking, so shocking that you laugh because you can't believe that that could actually be a result. But the issue is with surveys and the issue that the diversity agenda has is that you've got commitment, you know the facts. Most of you are scientists, really, really good at logic um, and fantastic problem solvers. I come from a family of engineers. And so the big challenge that you have is to take that knowledge and to take that survey data and do something with it. And through the partnership that the diversity agenda has created with Diversity Works, you've got the ability to share stories and find out who is doing this well. And I really encourage you um, and really look forward to next year um, seeing some quite different results um, uh, inside that survey. Kia ora and thank you. Kia ora, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel and Paul and Guillermo, who hopefully has caught us playing. Um, wonderful to get both your um, your perspectives and the insights from from your different places that come so much from the same place, um, and your stories. And um, I particularly love and the challenges we've we that really strong facing into those issues of equity versus equality because it does help to put some framing around you know that discomfort we feel in treating people differently to get over the fence um, and merit and what I think you were saying to us is that actually um, merit's an easy thing if you're looking at the one thing but you have to look at the underlying reasons and start to dismantle all the structures on the way that create the barriers to actually having the opportunities to get the book or the job or the CV. So um, thank you for really getting us into that space. Um, thank you all for coming and um, hope to see you at many more um, events and for everyone to be part of the both the commitment and the grassroots part of making this happen. Thank you. Kia ora.